the third lecture. Hope everyone got the handout. Uh, today's lecture also it has a connection with the previous week's lecture. So I'll be starting uh, drawing the timeline. And based on this, we'll start to explain about the introduction about the fundamentals of our tradition. So if you remember last week, we explained uh, how the Theravadian tradition is somewhat equal with the Mahaviharian tradition, which emerged in Sri Lanka. So if you draw the timeline, if, if I say this was the Buddha, actually the actual time the Buddha arose and Buddha passed away is somewhat controversial to modern scholars. Because in the traditional scripts, ancient scripts, it mentions around the 5th century, 6th century, six, around the 6th century, it means 500 BC around that, the Buddha appeared and passed away. But some scholars like Norman, they suggest that it was, it should be 400 BC around. So the time of the Buddha's actual appearance is, is a controversial according to the modern scholars, but this doesn't matter to us in this, in this course. Because we are focusing on the fundamentals of the Theravada tradition. So the historical facts doesn't affect much in this course. So if we just draw the Buddha's appearance, if we just assume that it was 5th BC, following the traditional explanation, then in the timeline, the first uh, shissing happened after 100 years of the Buddha's period. So this was the, the, around this area, around this time, the second council happened in Vesali. So this is normally roughly estimated at 100 years. Some say 60 years. Then in the third century, uh, uh, then in the third century BC, third century BC. So this is fifth century BC. There happened the third council. So this was the period where Buddhism came to Sri Lanka and was spread into other countries. Then afterwards, in the first century AD, first century BC, sorry, first century BC, the Tipitaka was written, the canon was written, writing the canon, writing down. Then in the 5th century AD, the Pali comment commentaries were put, committed into Pali. So Buddha goes as era. In common saying the Pali commentary, commentaries. Then starting from the around 8th century to 9th century AD, the sub-commentaries. It kept on going. So this is the normal timeline we can draw. So Theravada Buddhism came to Sri Lanka around this area and it was established in a monastery called Mahavihara. So the importance of this timeline is later on we are today's lecture we are going to discuss about the fundamentals of the Theravada tradition. So when we say fundamentals it means the facts that govern the whole entire doctrine. So some of the fundamentals we can historically trace based on the mentioning in the commentaries and the literary books. Some fundamentals got evolved in different eras. In different eras. So that is very crucial when we are going to examine the doctrine in terms of fundamentals. So that's why I uh, drew this timeline. So based on this we can start the course. So when we, when we are studying the Theravada doctrine, we have to be aware what sort of fundamentals we are talking. Because some fundamentals have appeared even in this era. But still, at the moment, we take them as main criteria to explain the doctrine. So even the fundamentals have appeared later on. The time period doesn't matter as long as they match with the doctrine. So this is the purpose that I draw the timeline and also it was a revision for our previous lecture. 
So the today's lecture, I'm going to focus, if you have the handout, the lecture number three. The topic says the fundamentals of the Mahavihara tradition, part one. So when I say Mahavihara, I'm referring to the Theravada present, Theravada tradition. Then uh, sub, the subtitle says the fundamentals and the rudimentary philosophies of the Mahavihara. So today I'm going to, in the first we are going to discuss about uh, two, two points, that is fundamentals and their philosophies. Fundamentals and the philosophies. So when I say a fundamental, I'm talking about a fact. When I say a fact, it means in a certain discourse community, a certain community, or maybe it can be a religious community, or uh, in a social community, whatever community, fact means something that is not needed to be proven. So a fact is something that is unanimously accepted by the community. So we also can talk it say it as a fundamental. So when I say the fundamental, it doesn't mean the, how to say, the, not the negative aspect. I'm talking about the basics of the doctrine of our religious community. So when I say the discourse community or the community of Mahavihara, it represents the Theravada tradition, the present Theravada tradition. They have preserved a certain canon that we call the Tipitaka. We have commentaries, sub-commentaries. The entire literature, I use the word doctrine. So this is also what, one, one point I want to emphasize. When I say the doctrine, I'm not referring to the Tipitaka or the Buddha's direct teachings. You normally say that the word I will be using is the canon. Canon is the Tipitaka. The commentaries, sub-commentaries, I'll be using the English term, Atakapa and Tika. Altogether, the commentaries and sub-commentaries and whatever literature belonging to the tradition, I'll be talk talking as the doctrine. So in this lecture. So when I say the doctrine, I'm referring to the entire literature. If I want to refer to the Tipitaka, I'll be using the word canon. So when I say the Theravada tradition, they have preserved a certain doctrine led by the canon, explanation of the commentaries, sub-commentaries, and they have a specific goal, the attainment of Nibbana, and they have explained it exclusively, they are different from the other schools. So therefore, we have certain attributes of a discourse community. It means uh, we can call it a, one kind of a group following a certain aim. And we also have, they also have certain uh, uh, I would say ways of explaining the doctrine. So when I say the facts, when I say the facts, facts and the fundamentals are equal here. So the uh, explanation about the definition about fact means a fact is something that doesn't need any uh, uh, doesn't need to be proven within a certain discourse capacity. For example, when we say the rebirth, example, when we say the rebirth, within the Buddhist community, this doesn't need to be proven. Everyone in the Buddhist community accept this unanimously. But when we say this rebirth to a scientific community, you cannot say it as a fact. It is something, it's just an opinion or it's something need to be proven. So when I say a fact or a fundamental, this means something that is unanimously accepted and followed by the tradition. They don't need to verify this point. So that is the idea of a fundamental. So the fundamentals introduced by the Buddha, for example, I'll be talking in, in this lecture, a few, fund, a few example. If I say all the conditioned realities are impermanent, this is a fundamental of our, of our teachings. When Buddha say the Kama gives a result, this is a fundamental accept, accepted by the religious group. So it doesn't need to be proven. So first thing is they accept the religion group, the Buddhist group, accept it based on the faith of faith, putting faith towards the Buddha. And the next thing is in the practice you are supposed to experience it by yourself. That's a different case. But from the uh, from the beginning, from the outset, we believe what the Buddha has said has to be correct. So when I say the fundamentals, I'm referring to the teachings that need not to be verified within this tradition. So when I say the philosophy, philosophy means the explanation why a fundamental is valid. What is the logic behind a fundamental? This can be argued. Even a fundamental can be argued in an objective point of view. 
But even though it can be argued within the Theravada community or within the Buddhist community, a fundamental means something which, is, which has been already accepted by the followers of the group. So if I say, uh, 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 take an uh, example out of the handout, if you can refer to the handout, page number one. <clears throat> the second paragraph says, if I repeat the, what I have mentioned already, facts are information that need not to be verified within a certain discourse community, especially in a religious community such as Mahavihara tradition, it means the Theravada tradition. These facts are based on certain philosophical notions. They can be termed as the rudimentary philosophical tenets of the community based on which the facts are formulated. So what do I mean here? So if you go to the third paragraph, which is a very easy, uh, how to say, simple example, third paragraph. Uh, one of the main notions in the Buddhist tradition is that all the conditioned realities are impermanent. It's a fundamental canonical theory. So we normally say Sabbe Sankara Anicca, all conditioned realities are impermanent. So this is the fundamental of our sasa. So normally how the Theravadians explain this notion, why everything which is conditioned is impermanent. The explanation is given as if this is condition. Condition means, which, I'm going, which we are going to explain in another two weeks about the conditionality in our tradition. Condition means something which arises, for example, A arises out of B. Because of B, A happens. A arises. So the notion is, the argument is, this B, which is not a permanent thing, which is not a very good logic in terms of, uh, how to say, logical point of view, but still, if this is not a permanent, if this is impermanent, whatever is begot or caused by this impermanent reality, how can it be permanent? So this is the argument the, the uh, uh, Buddhist race. If the reality is produced by or caused by impermanent realities, how can it be permanent? So that is, it's not a proving of the fundamental, it is made with observation. So if everything, whatever we experience is impermanent, whatever pleasure, whatever experience we get out of impermanent reality cannot be permanent. So that is the main idea. For example, if you go more further explanations about this point, normally we say kama. Kama is the action, produces the rebirth. Kama produces rebirth. Rebirth means a new life. So we can say kama produces a life. So kama means a certain action. This action has a beginning, this action has an end. So normally if we give dana or if we do a akusala kama, this has a certain range like happens and finishes. We are not doing the same kama for the, all, all the time. So therefore kama is an impermanent reality, impermanent action. So if a life is produced by an impermanent force, impermanent kama, this also is subject to be impermanent. So this is what I want to say is, the fundamental and the philosophy means, philosophy is the ex, uh, abstract explanation why the fundamental is valid. This can be brought into argument, this can be challenged. I'm not saying that we have to accept it, but the idea is if a fundamental is formed, we can have asked for a philosophy. Why is this fundamental correct? So likewise, in the tradition, when a fundamental is given, there should be an explanation for that. So that's what I say as a philosophical notion. So this is the terms that I have used. This may be not 100% accurate, but it's, it's, it's for the easiness of our studies. I term the facts as the fundamentals. Philosophies are the explanations beneath these fundamentals. And this philosophical notion can also again be another fundamental. It can be also a fact. So it is very difficult to differentiate these, the difference of the fundamentals and the facts. So in this course, normally the whole thing, the fundamentals and the philosophy or the explanation about the fundamental, both I will be addressing as a fact. So then we have to understand how these facts emerged, in which time and from whom these facts emerged. So if I give another ex example given in, the, uh, uh, in our doctrine, if you can go to the page number two,
the page number two, the first paragraph, it explains normally another fundamental piece, comma, produces vipaka. I'm using the Pali words, these are simple Pali words, I think all of you understand. Kama is the action, wholesome, unwholesome, they produce vipaka. So, what is the philosophy behind it? Why a kama, why a certain action produces a result? So, the Theravadians explain that if there is a latent tendency, latent craving, latent craving, it means if you still have the craving to live, craving to see objects, craving to hear sounds, this sort of craving is still present in us. Whatever action we do has the potency of producing a result in the future. So it's like the, they give the example, it's like the root. When a tree, the roots of a tree is uh, healthy, the flowers that uh, comes on this tree, they are the fruits. In the same way, if the latent craving is remaining in a certain being, whatever good or bad actions he does will result in good or bad ways. So when the latent craving is removed, we normally call him an arahant. Whatever action he does will not give results in future. So this is the philosophy the Buddha say, Buddha want to say, as long as you have the craving for your life, whatever action gives, will produce will give results. Then another, for example, this is the philosophy of this fundamental. So then we can also further deepen this philosophy. We can ask the question, how the latent craving is connected to the karma? How the latent craving is connected to the karma? I'm not taking time for this. I'll be explaining this because our uh, ha, uh, course is listed. There will be uh, a few few lectures that will be dedicated for the karma. On these lectures, I'll explain how personally I would explain this latent craving, the relation of latent craving on karma based on the Theravada tradition. So what I want to say is a certain philosophy beneath the fundamental can be further elaborated or questioned and uh, make, uh, we can find out the more reasons. So that is the point I want to emphasize. So there, will be, there is another example given in the page number one, in the page number one, which is a technical uh, creation of a technical fundamental. I will also explain this point. This is mostly based on Abhidhamma and Vipassana. According to the Abhidhamma explanations and also the Vipassana practice, normally when a person attains the higher noble attainments like the Magga and Pala, the path, the mind process works as Manodwara Vajana and four Javanas, and then we come into the path and Pala. And we go, the mind goes into the Pavanga. So this four chitta normally we address as Gotrabhu. Right? So this Gotrabhu, according to tradition, this is a very, uh, how to say, uh, not an explanation that you can find in the suttas directly. So this Gotrabhu has the object of Nibbana. So this Magga and Pala also has the object of Nibbana. Then these three chittas have the object of Sankhara. This is a Vipassana chittas. Then what happens is this Gotrabhu Chitta in the tradition is neither considered as a Vipassana Chitta, it means Patipada, Jnana, Visuddhi, anyway, the simple word Vipassana, and neither it is a Chitta which eradicates the Kilesa. So when we come to the seven purifications, the teachers they exclude this Gotrabhu. It's neither belong to the uh, supra mundane side, neither belongs to the vipassana side. So this became an isolated chitta. So what the reason they give is, if something to be considered as a vipassana chitta, the object should be sankhara, because Gotrabhu doesn't have the object of sankhara. So it doesn't fit to be called vipassana. Then what happened, if something to be called a jnana dasana visuddhi, I'll be using this uh, technical terms, in, in simple terms, the lokutra chittas, so it to, to, to be considered as a Lokutra or, or to be considered as a Jnana Dasana Visuddhi, this, the Chitta has to eradicate Kilesa. The eradication of Kilesa happens at this moment. So therefore, Gotrabhu neither eradicate Kilesa, doesn't have Sankara as the object, so we term it differently. So this is what I want to say is, this is a very technical uh, fundamental. What I want to say is, the way a fundamental is formulated, Normally, in the Theravada tradition, most of the cases, they have a certain philosophy, right? They have a certain philosophy. 
So now we're going to explain how these fundamentals got evolved. Most of the fundamentals that we have in the doctrine have got evolved from the Buddha. So we say in this area, most of the fundamentals got evolved. I'll put it number one. So the Buddha's knowledge and also uh, the, uh, the teachings that the Buddha has given. So normally, some teachings have been given by the Savakas, the disciples also. And also some teachings have, according to the modern philologists, the, uh, the Tipitaka that we have is a back translation from another language. So whatever it is, this, uh, the first part of fundamentals I attribute to the Buddha is the deep, great knowledge. Then comes these fundamentals that the understanding of the Buddha, he expounded in suttas and also in various ways. So some fundamentals we can found, most of the fundamentals we can found, find in the sutta. Then you have a question, what is this number one and what is this number two? What do I mean by number one? Because these represent the fundamentals that I am explaining suttas, gathas, what you find in the Tipitaka. So what do I mean by number one? Number one I mean is the Buddha's foundation knowledge based on which he expounded the teachings. So for that we have a very good information found in the uh, found in the Suttas. If you go to the page number three, page number two and three, sources of origin of discourse community facts of the Mahavihara tradition. At the bottom of the page number two. Discourse community facts of the tradition plausibly have four sources of origin. All the basic fundamentals of Buddha Vachana, it means the teachings of the Buddha, are attributed to the knowledge of the Buddha, which he attained by understanding the verity of existence. So what I want to say is, in one sutta he mentioned, what he understood and what he expounded is, uh, if you compare the amount, he says, the, he took some uh, leaves on his hand and explained, what I expounded you is like the leaves on my hand, and what I understood is like the leaves on this whole forest. So the basic knowledge he had, based on that, he expounded the suttas. So then if you go to the number two, some of the basic, some of these basic fundamentals are clearly stated in certain suttas and stanzas. When I say stanzas, I'm referring to Dhammapada and all this. And these teachings, which became fundamental facts, are of two types, delivered by the Buddha, delivered by the Savakas, like Sariputta, Mukalana, and very other great disciples. So they want the difference of the number one and the number two. For that, we have to go to the bottom of the page number three. Relation of Buddhist discourse community facts with the knowledge of the Buddha. There is a very nice sutta called Dutiya Vihara Sutta, which I have given in this handout. According to this handout, he mentions Buddha once went into a three month retreat for isolation. So there he practiced, spent time meditating, and after coming from the retreat, he mentioned that, he mentioned that I have been spending time contemplating on what I understood under the Bodhi tree. So he gave a discourse mentioning that how feeling could happen based on different, different causes. So if you go to the page number four, the translation is given in English. It says, so when the first part it says, I wish to go for a retreat for three months. Then after coming out of the retreat, in the uh, fourth, uh, fourth paragraph of the quoting, uh, quotation, because I have been dwelling in part of the abode in which I dwelt just after I became fully enlightened. I have understood thus. There is feeling with wrong view as conditioning. Condition. Also feeling with subsiding of wrong view as condition. There is feeling with right view as condition. Also feeling with the subsiding of right view as condition. So it goes, keeps on going. There is feeling with the wrong concentration, which are ditti as condition. Also feeling with the subsiding of wrong concentration as condition. There is feeling with the right concentration as condition. Also feeling with the subsiding of the right concentration as, uh, uh, as a condition. There is feeling with desire as condition. Also feeling with the subsiding of desire as condition. There is feeling with thought as condi condition. Also feeling with the subsiding of thought as condition, with takka. There is feeling with perception as condition. Also the subsiding of perception as condition. When desire has not subsided, subsided and thoughts has not subsided and perception has not subsided, there is feeling with that as condition. 
when desire has subsided and thought has subsided and perception has subsided, there is also feeling with that as condition. There is effort for the attainment for the as yet unattained. When that state has been reached, there is also feeling that as condition. So this shows a certain kind of a fundamental knowledge the Buddha has attained under the Bodhi tree. And based on this, he preached the suttas. So if you go to some suttas and also what is explaining Abhidhamma, you find this explanation match fits with some explanations given about the Vedana. For example, about information can be named as a list of discourse community facts related to the conditionality of Vedana. These facts directly collaborate with and depict great resemblance to the information found in the canon of Abhidhamma and some suttas. Hence, it is flagrant that the Buddha expounded his teachings based on the understanding he attained, which is the very basic fundamentals of all his teachings. So, this is a very, uh, how to say, good example to show that, that the Buddha had a basic foundation about the knowledge from which he expounded his teachings. So, when I say number one, I'm talking about this knowledge, which we cannot guess or which we cannot uh, assume completely. Based on that knowledge, we have the suttas given and recorded. So, and some of these, when we come to number two, as the Buddha Vachana, as it was explained in the first, first lecture, some discourses were given by the Savakas. And those teachings are still considered as similar to the Buddha's teachings, as long as they match with the basic fundamentals of the canon. So therefore, we have two types of teachings, Savaka Basita and Buddha Basita. I'll be explaining a little bit about the Savaka Basita. If you go to the page number five, Savaka Basita. Savaka Basitas are of two types. Some fundamentals formulated from the discourses of the master. It means they are directly taken from the discourses or formulated based on the discourses and fundamentals formulated by the disciples' own intellectual aptitudes and spiritual experiences. So this can be proven. This is the, this is the idea the tradition held. It means there is a commentarial teaching, whether this story is verified or not, it doesn't matter. What the idea, how the, how the tradition held regarding this Savaka Basita is what matters. So there is a story about a past Buddha called Anoma Dasi. According to this story, two, two Theras, Anoma and Nisaba, the two great disciples of the Buddha, gave two discourses on the same subject matter. This is explained in the uh, next paragraph. They gave us uh, these two discourses on the same subject matter. But it says that the Thera Anoma, the second disciple, gave the discourse, it mentioned, depending on the Tipitaka, depending on the teachings of the Buddha of Anoma Dasi. Then the first disciple gave the teaching based on his Parami Jnana. Parami Jnana means his own intellectual abilities. So what does this mean? The two Theras gave the same discourse, the discourse regarding the same subject matter, but the commentary says one choose to quote the uh, teachings of the Buddha directly and the other one gave a discourse based on his own ability. So what does this mean? Savakas are capable of creating new discourses as long as they match with the fundamentals of the teaching. This is not considered as a problem in this Theravada tradition. So therefore, some, for example, uh, I have given an example regarding the Venerable Sariputta's explanation in the Mahavedala Sutta. So some discourse, some explanations are given through his own experience. And later, the commentators, the tradition has accepted this as fundamental. So they all, the Savaka, Basita and Buddha Basita, both fall into number two. Then comes another group of discourse community facts or the uh, fundamentals, which happened from the time of the Buddha and got evolved in the 3rd century. This is the Abhidhamma and the books like Patisambhida. Books like Patisambhida. So some scholars have the idea that Abhidhamma originated time from the Buddha because of the Matikas, which, were, uh, which has a very long history. And it could evolve, and the culmination of Abhidhamma is ex explained normally at the Katavatu in the Third Council when the Mogadi Putisa preached the Katavatu. So there are many lots of fundamentals explained in this Abhidhamma and Patisan Vidamakas. These fundamentals, whether they are ancient or whether they happen in a, during the uh, evolution, 
So as long as they match with the teachings, that's what matters to the tradition. Some fundamentals they have maybe have uh, explained to explain the suttas, or some fundamentals have directly come from the Buddha, which are, cannot be found in the suttas. Whatever it is, as long as it explains the non-selfness, it explains the four noble truths, and it helps the practice of a disciple, that's what matters in the end. So if you go to the how the, for example, how the suttas and Abhidhamma, or the knowledge in Abhidhamma is, uh, how to say, useful to explain a sutta. I have given an example in the page number nine. So in this uh, handout, there are few fundamentals to explain based on Abhidhamma. In this course, I'll be explaining a lot in further, uh, in further lectures. And also some fundamentals which are unique to Patisamhita Magga. I have given an example. So if I go to page number nine, there are under the topic, few discourse community facts related to the theory of causality as found in Abhidhamma. So there are three causal, varied, causal explanations, the noble truths, Patiksa Sampada and 24 Pachyas according to Abhidhamma. So there are two uh, Pachyas related to 24 conditional relations. If you go to Asevana and Upanishad, if I brief this explanation, Asevana means if you keep on doing the same, same action again and again, Buddha had a philosophical idea, this action get intensified. It means if you keep on doing the same action again and again, repeat the same action, then the intensity of this action grows, the strength of this action grows. That's why if you keep on meditating, your uh, concentration increases. If you keep on doing a bad habit, this habit gets rooted in our memory, rooted in our mind, and it starts to get intensified. This is called the Asevana Pachya. Then if you go to Upanishya Pachya, Upanishya Pachya means certain mental attributes, no, mostly mental attributes, causes for some other men related mental attributes to happen at a later time. It means, if you take, this is the mind stream, chitta arising and passing away, some actions which were done in a certain period, for example, maybe in a past life or maybe in the same life, these actions that we accumulated could influence at a later time for a similar sort of, or similar or related actions, related emotions or qualities to happen again. So with the time gap, this kind of influence is mentioned in, in Buddhist teachings. So there are few types of such uh, influences made through the time. For example, come, if you do a kamma, result will come at a later time. If we practice certain qualities, they will affect for us to do it again like habits which are very difficult to overcome. So this is explained at Upanishad. It means if we do good things, it can cause again our mind to do the similar good things. So this is called, we can call habitual relation of the mind. So this is called Upanishad. So the difference of Asevan and Upanishad is, Upanishad causes related mental attributes to happen again at a later time. Asevana means if you keep on doing, the later, at later mental states will get intensified the strength of the actions will increase. So how these uh, two uh, uh, fundamental causal relations are explained in Sukta So I have given an example. If you go to the page number 10. If you go to the page number 10. It explains Samadhi Vikare Bhaveta. If I call the Pali term, Samadhi. It means monks practice the samadhi. Then Buddha explains. Samadhi to bhikkave yatha bhutam pajana. So this teaching includes both these Asevana and Upanishad. How do we understand? So Buddha says, develop the Samadhi. Develop Samadhi means frequent it. Do it again and again, not only once. When you keep on doing the practice of the Samadhi, what happens is it gets intensified. So this teaching was given, this admonishment was given based on the philosophy that if you keep on doing the same thing at later time, that quality gets intensified. That's the Asevana Pachya explained in Abhidhamma. So then, samahito bhikkave, one who has concentration, what happened? Yata bhuta pajanati, he will see the truth. 
So this Jatabunta Ajara can represent the Panya wisdom. Then Samahito represents concentration. Concentration or wisdom are related to each other according to Buddhist teachings. So he will never say, if you have loba, you will get wisdom. No, Buddha will never say such a teaching. He will say, if you have concentration, you may get the wisdom. So concentration is a different quality, wisdom is a different quality. So that explains the Upanishad Pachya. Certain mental attributes, causes, different related mental attributes to happen at a later time. So when this sutta, this teaching, is put into the causal relation of 24 pachyas. You can find the first teaching is aimed at the Asevana pachya. The second phrase is explained aimed at the Upanishad pachya. So, likewise, the fundamentals you find in the Abhidhamma and in Patisapida Magga are greatly helpful for us to understand certain sutras. So, then I will to come to the last phase of the lecture. Right. The last phase, so the fourth, fourth type of fundamentals. Page number 11. Discourse community facts found in the commentarial and sub-commentarial literature. So up to now we found certain fundamentals are attributed to the Buddha's knowledge and some are explained in the suttas, not all. Then certain fundamentals are found in Abhidhamma and some in Patisandhidhamma. Then some fundamentals are found exclusively in the commentarial, sub-commentarial literature. That is the uh, fourth type of fundamentals we are going to discuss. About. These four types of fundamentals again are divided into four eras, four times. For that, we have to again go back to the page number three, page number two and three. So in the Roman num uh, Hindu numbers, uh, Arabic numbers, we have one, two, three, four. First is the knowledge of the Buddha. Second are the discourses that we have in the Tipitaka. And the third is the Abhidhamma and Patisambhida books like that. Mm -hmm. Then fourth, num fourth number four is the, the discourse community facts are, which are exclusive to the commentary. So these discourse community facts have originated in four different eras. Fundamentals formulated while the Buddha was still alive. The fundamentals formulated during the period between the Buddha's demise and introduction of Buddhism to Ceylon. The fundamentals formulated during the period between the introduction of Buddhism to Ceylon and the compilation of Pali commentaries. Fundamentals formulated during the period between compilation of Pali commentaries and composition of sub-commentaries. I have given some examples with that. So if you draw the timeline. So we have the Buddha here. <coughs> 5th century BC, then we came in 3rd century BC, 3rd council, then we had the 5th, 5th AD, 5th century AD, then we had 8th century AD. Yeah, the Pali commentaries were written. Then the sub -commentaries. So we had fundamentals number one and two around this area, this period, then Abhidhamma and Patisamida. Number three fundamentals here. Number four fundamentals, some got originated from the Buddha, but it is very difficult to explain, differentiate these fundamentals. Which are the which got originated from the Buddha and are which are exclusively mentioned in the commentaries. But the, even the scholars suggest that some commentarial explanations have originated from the Buddha because uh, Buddha also used certain commentarial type of explanations to explain his teachings. So some fundamentals we assume that would have formulated by the Buddha, but we can't exactly say which fundamentals. So based on this assume we say 4.1, 4.1 came from the time of the Buddha. Then there are fundamentals which got formulated after the Buddha has passed away until the introduction of Buddhism to Ceylon. So normally third council, after third council, Buddhism was introduction, introduced to Ceylon. During this period, there are certain fundamentals. For example, normally we hold an idea, one kamma gives one rebirth. 
and not many commas can give a collectively a boundary but this is a very basic fundamental in the theravada tradition actually according to the commentaries this fundamental was firstly advocated or authorized by theras living in saketa at a later period from the buddha it is possible that such an idea monks have held to such an idea even the th from th starting from the time of the buddha or close to his demise but actually this is recorded to have been uh, authorized at a later time so i normally call these fundamentals which arose which happened after the buddha has passed away he said this is the buddha's era after the buddha has passed away to till the introduction of buddhism to sri lanka then after the buddhism was introduced to sri lanka till the pali commentaries were written there are certain fundamentals explained or propounded by theras in ceylon these fundamentals are also taken by the tradition to explain the teachings i have given some examples in the handout what sort of fundamentals they are for example if i give a one example normally the buddha's teachings say if we do our destiny in the next life or our appearance in the next life is determined by the karma so one of the teras in ceylon he further tried to explain this fundamental and explain for example if you are born as a cat or if you are born as a dog based on the karma the appearance is cannot be exactly cannot say that all the appearance of these cats and dogs are based on the karma is a very very uh, logical thing to understand so what the tera has mentioned is what the buddha wanted to advocate when we say the karma decides our appearance and many facts on our next life what he want to say is the karma decides which species you are born in based on certain actions we are born as dog we are born as cats because some uh, uh, actions the buddha would say if you follow this this type of a life you will be a dog if you follow this type of a life you will be a cow you can find in vegan nikaya for two ascetic senior kenya he explains this kind of a uh, uh, explanation so what the tera wanted to say was the karma decides which species we are born in then the nature of the species decides our appearance our I mean the animal's appearance so this is a fundamental explained during this period then there are certain fundamental which happen after the commentaries and till the sub commentaries so 4.4 these are the fundamentals that they use to explain certain canonical and commentarial teachings which were not explained in detail up to this era for example why uh, abhinaya chitta doesn't give this up i'll be talking about these points in detail i'm just giving a brief outlook about this what the fundamentals are and how they got originated so certain explanations happen after the common period which you just come so this is the lecture so what i want to emphasize was the difference between a fundamental and a bit philosophical point beneath the fundamental and these fundamentals got evolved with the time certain fundamental i can say in a nutshell certain fundamentals are attributed to the buddha's knowledge some are some of such fundamentals are expounded in the suttas by buddha and also by savakas and lots of fundamentals are explained in abhidhamma and patisambhidhamma which was evolving in the 3rd century then some fundamentals are exclusively found in the commentary you cannot find these fundamentals in tipitaka so they also can be explained with four uh, in four eras some would have got originated from the time of the buddha which we cannot differentiate clearly then some are clearly have got originated after buddha has passed away till the introduction of buddhism to ceylon then found some fundamentals got originated while buddhism was in ceylon before the pali commentaries were written because why do i say that these fundamentals are written in pali commentaries for them to be written in pali commentaries they got originated before pali commentaries. then some fundamentals are not even mentioned in the commentaries but they are mentioned in the sub commentaries they say that's how we explain this teaching so these fundamentals have originated in a period after the pali commentaries so what i want to in the end what i want to say is when we say the theravada tradition what we have today it is the doctrine is based on these types of fundamentals some are very basic fundamentals some are secondary fundamentals and some have evolved very later so if the later fundamentals whether they are authentic or whether they are valid are depending on how they match the basic fundamental if a secondary fundamental which have evolved at a later time if it contradicts with these basic fundamentals the tradition always rejects it what i want to say is some explanations given by later theras 
as the fundamentals were rejected by different, different disciples saying that these fundamentals rejected them. So it doesn't mean that a tradition has to accept all whatever mentioned in the books. It has to be evaluated based on the basic fundamentals. But what I want to say is when we explain the tradition, it is based on such type of fundamental. If we want to reject a certain teaching, we have to go to understand what the fundamental says and whether how it can be rejected based on the basic fundamental. So these are the points that I want to emphasize in this lecture. So I'll uh, give the opportunity if someone want to raise questions. Yes, sir. Uh, he can ask. And uh, last week, our brother from I think Russia, huh? you explained and asked about the five uh, uh, reasons of the first Buddhist split in by caused by Mahadeva. So the five uh, causes I found in uh, but actually the source is from Singhali's book which you cannot read. So I'll give you the explanation. Some I gave were wrong last week, right? So I'll read, read them out. And Arahant can do a sin without knowing. That is the first thing they say. Arahant can do a sin, Akusala, without knowing that. Then an Arahant may not know about his attainment. He may be Arahant, but he doesn't know he's an Arahant. This is a, a fundamental uh, teaching expound by Mahadeva. Then an Arahant may have doubts about the doctrine. He may not be completely fully aware of the, uh, uh, fully free from the doubts. It is not possible to attain arahanthood without the help of a teacher, which is also explained in Theravada tradition. One can attain his noble aspirations by saying statements such as, oh, this is suffering, and so on, while he is meditating. So these are the five facts that Mahadeva has advocated. And some traditions believe the first split happened not because of the disciplinary rules, because of these five uh, uh, reasons. You can also uh, uh, I have, uh, have the uh, lecture sign a uh, website. So in the discussion panel, I have also mentioned this one. Yes. No, what I want, uh, what was that? Uh, in, in the after hundred years of the Buddha's passing away, there was the first split of the Buddha Sangha. So normally, the Theravada is explained it happened because of uh, ten, ten disciplinary matters. Some groups didn't follow the rules, and the, some groups wanted to follow, so they have the split happened. So the Sangha got divided into Mahasangika and Theravada. But the Mahasangika history says actually the ten disciplinary rules were unanimously agreed upon by all the uh, Sangha after the council. The split actually happened because of one Thera called Mahadeva expounded the, advocated these five notions. So some didn't agree with that. Some agreed with that. So the split happened. So this is found, not be found in Theravada tradition, in other traditions. Why the first uh, division of Sangha happened? Yes. May I ask a point number two, please? Page number three. Yes. Um, these fundamental facts, discourse delivered by the disciple, does it need to be a book? Sorry for that, I couldn't hear you properly. Can you repeat? Yeah. Um, number two B. Number two B. Yeah. These become fundamental facts, does it need to be. Um, yes. So uh, Thank you for your question. So what the Sian is asking. The second question is I mentioned Buddha Basita and Savaka Basita. But according to the tradition, there are another two types of Basita, Isi Basita and Deva Basita. It means some discussions had happened with the Dev, Buddha had happened with Devas. So Devas utterances are also explained in the in the teaching, uh, recorded in the teaching. So these Deva Basitas, according to the tradition, can be correct and can be wrong. And there are some also discussions with some Isi, like, like ascetics. So they are this the discussion mostly they ask the questions or they make explanation. 
So these explanations or so questions which were asked by the ascetics can be correct and can be wrong. Some can become fundamental, some cannot become fundamental. Yes, that's the normal answer. But Savaka Basita and Buddha Basita, uh, Buddha Basita is surely a fundamental. Savaka Basita are also fundamentals if the Savaka Basita was not rejected by the Buddha. Then the next question was, for a Savaka Basita to become considered as a fundamental, what is the criteria? That is the uh, points that also I wanted to explain the last week. So there are few ways the Savaka Basitas are approved. One is in some suttas like uh, Madhupindika and Mahaveda, uh, Chulla Vedala, at the end of the discourse given by the disciple, Buddha says, this discourse I approve and this discourse, if I had preached this discourse, I would have done it in the same manner. So this is an official approval given by the Buddha. Some Savaka Basitas have approved in such a way. Then another two I personally uh, uh, think like, think like, uh, means some Savaka Basitas like given by Sariputta, Mukharana and some other disciples are not approved so. So maybe it can be a, a approval given by the Buddha in a casual gathering. Casual gathering means monks used to come and meet Buddha and have discussions about uh, Kamatana, about the meditation and so forth. In such a way, in such an occasion, if, uh, if the disciple used to say, our teacher used to give such and such a discourse, if the Buddha said, yes, this is also enough for a Savaka Basita to come into the camp. And the next thing is, I also assume that if the Buddha was still aware of a certain discourse given by the Savatas, the cir it's circulating within the tradition, but if he doesn't reject it, his non-rejection is also, awareness and non-rejection is also enough for Savaka Basita to find, Basita to find the place in the tradition. Then, why these Savaka Basitas were included? Because of two reasons we can assume. First is the trust. And uh, 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 trust, uh, in trust, uh, trust made by the Buddha upon certain savakas. For example, if you look at the Etadanga Pali of Anguttara Nikaya, most of these savakas were titled, uh, given titles as saying foremost in the sasana. So when the Buddha has kept a uh, uh, strong trust upon a certain savaka, whatever he used to utter, normally got the appreciation and uh, faith of the uh, tradition. The next thing is the Buddha has given a criteria called Mahapadesa. This is the most important thing. Mahapadesa. In this Mahapadesa, Buddha explains the criteria. For first, uh, a monk comes with a teaching and he says, I heard this teaching directly from the Buddha, from the Sangha, from a group of monks or from an elderly learned monk. So then the Buddha, this advice was given close to his demise. Buddha gave his discourse uh, advice when uh, he was close to the demise. So he mentioned, if a certain monk comes with a claim that this teaching is authentic, you should not accept it at once. You have to evaluate it based on the Mahapadesa. Mahapadesa means you have to judge it with the four noble truths. You have to judge it with the Patitisampada. It means the... Uh, uh, or dependent origination, doctrine of dependent origination, and also the eradication of loba, dosa, moha. If the teaching match with these fundamental teachings, we can consider, Buddha said, you can consider this as an uh, authentic teaching. He never says to check the historical fact. That is the one, one very important point. He never says to check the linguistic approach. They have to be applied. But the main thing is, if a teaching matches with the gist of the main doctrine, it is enough for a teaching to be considered as authentic. Because the thing is, in ancient days, the teachings were spread all over the, how to say, Indians, uh, southern Indian subcontinent, and there were no uh, channels of good communication. So there are lots of evidences, even in the Theravada tradition, that the teachings were spread all over India. And they were not collected even in the first council. Not all the teachings were uh, collected in the first council. So what happened was Buddha was very aware of this fact. Because a monk who had gone into a faraway district, come at a later time and suddenly say, I heard this from the Buddha, or I heard this from the Sangha. Most of the members in the Sangha are unaware of this reason. And maybe his disciples, the disciples' disciples would come. So generations has passed away. There is no way to judge the historical event, whether it happened or not. So Buddha was so wise a person. He gave a criteria. Don't go to decide the uh, historical facts. Just find whether it matches with my main teachings. If it matches, even though the history is wrong, 
doesn't matter, you can consider this as a teaching of my teaching. And also you can uh, prove this notion by, if you look into the sutta called Uttara Vipati Sutta. I have given this in the first time out. Uttara Vipati Sutta. He uttered a discourse, a monk called Uttara uttered a discourse. Then and he had a discussion with the Sakka, the god king of gods. And the Sakka asked, one thing, did, did, from where did you learn this sutta, with this teaching? He said, I le uh, he said, I expounded this sutta based on the teachings of the Buddha. He gave a simile. If a person brings gold from a heap of gold in a village, and someone asks, from where you bring this gold? The answer would be, I bring it from that heap. In the same way, whatever teachings a Savaka expounds are based on the Buddha's teachings. He never said, I caught it from the Buddha. Then the Sakka was surprised and he said, this is amazing, but hey, this same teaching as you have uttered, Buddha has uttered in Rajagaha when the Devadatta was committing a heavy, heavy, heavy sin. So the suttas were identical. Uttara, whenever Uttara was not aware that he, the Buddha has expounded a similar teaching. And he also said, whatever teaching based on uh, Savakas expound are based on the Buddha's teachings. So what does this mean? For a Savaka Basita to be considered as a fundamental, we have to evaluate based on Mahaprabhisa. So the gist, gist of the teaching doctrine is preached by the Buddha. There is no argument in that. But some Savaka Basitas also were considered as similar in the rank as long because they match with the fundamentals of the Buddhist uh, canonical teachings. Yes. Sorry. Deva Basita. Actually, Deva Basita means not the Dhamma preached by the Deva. Mostly, there are, uh, if you look into the Sangyutta Nikaya, Devata Sangyutta, Deva Buddha Sangyutta, there are discussions with the Buddha and the Devas. So, the Buddha, Devas normally post a question. Or pose a question, or may they may utter uh, some kind of idea they have in front of Buddha. Sometimes the Buddha accepts it. Sometimes the Buddha re uh, amends it and tells something, uh, something more advanced. So these kind of discussion, in discussions, the uh, utterance of the devas are called deva basita. It is not necessarily that the deva are preaching to them, but some some suttas, the sakka, there are teach, there are suttas that mentions that the, the sakka is preaching dhamma to other devas. So some Deva Basita are like discourse Dhamma talks. Most of the Deva Basitas are the discussions which happen with the Buddha and the Devas or Buddha, Deva and Savakas. Yeah. So most of them will be fundamental. No, most of them will not be the fundamentals. Yeah, it's mostly like a question. It's like a question. They are asking questions mostly. Yeah. And the Buddha, the Buddha, the Buddha, the Buddha. Yes, yes. To the Savakas next time. Yeah. So this is in the in the Sutta Dajita. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can say more. Uh, fun, you mean uh, whether no. Deva Basita is a fundamental yeah, or not? But they say that some is fundamental, some yeah. is not. Yes. So I want. So that's why I ask the question. It means it's like this. Now, Devata, Deva, yeah. right? And the Buddha, if I draw it, so he makes the questions, he gives the answer, yes. right? And this discussion, normally the Buddha next day morning, Buddha tells to the Sangha. That's how the custom was, right? Or maybe another day. So then these two question and answer both are recorded, memorized by the monks, right? So most of the fundamental will be the answer, right? Question will not be a fundamental. Right? So in some cases, they come and utter, like it's not a question, they some come and say, I feel like this. For example, one Brahmite says, he saw the Devas and humans are passing away very quickly uh, compared to their life. So he come and say, he encouraged the people, in, in front of the Buddha he uttered, everyone should give up the attachment to sensual desire and practice jhana. Then the Buddha, according to Buddha, Buddha knows Brahmas also have a certain limited lifespan. 
So Buddha changed the Atanas and he expounded, it's not that you have to only abandon the lust or get into jhana, you have to eradicate and give up all the attachment to all the sankharas because you have to attain Nibbana to become, how to say, attain the permanent uh, condition of unity. So likewise, some utterances uttered by devas were amended or changed. So some utterances Buddha accepted. So these are ex accepted ones, we can call it fundamentals, but otherwise others are not supposed to be fundamentals. So then we'll uh, take the break and we'll start the next session. Thank <laughs> you.